All right, welcome back everybody. And uh, now we get to see what this looks like. We've heard from different disciplines. Now let's look at a day in the life of, remember our goals, stand up early, often, right? Keep the patient as functional as possible. Our patient is a 62 year old male with COPD, declining health over the past year since his wife passed away. Right, Tim has been having difficulty caring for himself recently and can no longer watch his granddaughter, the love of his life. He has had a few falls, doesn't eat much because he doesn't have the energy to fix himself things and he doesn't much feel like eating. So he probably sounds like a lot of the patients we see, right? He's been in hospital for two days. His goal is to go home. The care team is looking at temporary placement for him to build up his strength and evaluate his ability to live by himself due to his falls and decreased self-care. His mobility goal is daily walking in the room. So let's pause for a second, because so often we are focused on the shift ahead of us, right? We're, we're focused on the day, the tasks, the numbers, the consults, the activities we have to do, but let's stop for a moment. And think, this is Tim. This is what matters most, right? His dog, his granddaughter. Let's never forget that our patients have a life before they come to us. Our job is to restore whatever they came in with without adding new problems to help them get back to their life and what matters most. Tim's mobility goals, the two things that keep him going are seeing his granddaughter and his dog. What matters most to him is to get home, not fall anymore, get stronger so he can care for himself, watch his granddaughter and walk his dog, walk Cooper. Consider Tim's quality of life if he's in a nursing home not able to have his dog, not able to see his granddaughter except occasional visits, not able to go home safely. He loses his freedom. What would you want for your parent, your spouse? What would you want for yourself? Each one of us has an opportunity to impact Tim's outcome. Let's make it personal. We're talking, we're going to talk about the tools. We have setting mobility goals. We have different tools for that. And you may have heard about these throughout the conference. We've got tools to achieve by discharge, right? We have Ampac six clicks or, or sorry, the um, Johns Hopkins HLM. We have daily mobility goals. We have the therapist evaluation. We've got ICU mobility levels. We've got different tools to help us establish what we can get done by discharge. We've got functional capacity tools that help us measure progress over time. What could the patient do? Their Ampac 6 clicks fits in the functional capacity column. The FIM scores, Bartel scores, the SPPB scores, timed up and go scores. These are all metrics that tell us how the patient's doing and if they're making progress. And then we have a just-in-time mobility screen. What can the patient do right now? This guides our appropriate use of assistive technology to replace manual handling. You've heard about this already in the main session. You've heard about the BMAT, the BMAT 2.0, the VA MSST. These are all examples of a mobility screen that can, yes, in, um, help us uh, populate our assessment. They're part of our assessment, but these are also used as mobility screens. Katrina's easy things. We touched on this the last one. I said I'd go into it more here. And Katrina Locke, if you're hearing this, I've just adopted it. Instead of every time saying with permission, I've, they're just now Katrina's easy things. Up to a chair for meals, sit up on the edge for meds, medications, vital signs. You heard Kaylee say this. We're going to see this in action and we're going to do some comparing and contrasting. Encourage patient participation, multiple sit to stands during toileting, encouraging rolling side to side. Do not do it for the patient. Empower them to do things for themselves. Promote consistent messaging across all caregivers. Right, so we're going to see some videos now and compare contrast with provider rounds, with a medical student, morning vitals, oral med pass, 
up to the bathroom, therapy, respiratory therapy, back to bed after being up for a long time, repositioning in bed, recovery from the floor in the event of a patient fall. I'd like you to take a card or a piece of paper or something right now, and each time you see a mobility activity, tally how many we do in a day. And then when we talk about it at the end, when we do questions, I want to know how many times did we get mobility for Tim throughout his day? I want you to compare and contrast and write yourself notes. Patient safety, caregiver safety, optimal patient participation. We're going to be talking about this with each video. So let's start our day for Tim. This is a day in the life of Tim. The provider is going to come in. This is a med Good student. Good morning, Tim. I'm Dr. Smith. How are you feeling today? Good, Dr. Smith. Good. So part of your recovery is going to be moving and doing these exercises. And there's going to be nurses and therapists that come in throughout the day. And you just got to work with them. I know it might hurt, but you just got to power through it because it's an important part about getting better. I thought that part of my recovery was to uh, stay in bed and rest and not to get up and move around with therapists and nurses and stuff. Those kinds of things definitely are not going to feel great at first, but the key here is little bits of movement uh, throughout the day is going to help you alleviate that pain in the long run, as well as keep at bay different complications uh, with bed rest, such as bed sores or, or other things that wouldn't be, wouldn't be very comfortable for you. Okay. You know what? Well, I'm here with you. Why don't we sit up and let's have a listen to those lungs. I saw on your chart that your mobility levels of 3P, which means you can sit up by yourself. So I'm yep. very, very glad to see you're moving. Let's see. Oh, good, good job. Good. good job. Is anyone jotting down mobility, right? Did he just move? Yes. You heard if you were in the BMAT session or in the MSST session, a three or a three P means the patient can sit up by themselves. They've got strength in their legs and they are not able to stand without assistance, right? Uh, three P in the MSST, they need help to stand. A three in the BMAT, there are some, um, some mild differences there that we obviously need to know which tool you're using and what those scores actually mean. But the bottom line is he was able to sit up by himself. The doctor could have listened to his lungs in supine, right? Would that have been mobile? No. So let's now look at... Um, Good morning, Tim. Vital signs. What does this look like? And now you'll start to see some compare contrast, right? On the left-hand side, we have traditional practice. On the right-hand side, we have safe early continuous mobility. The patient is being asked, can you sit up? Let's not assume he can't. Let's check his ability to sit up, right? How much more time does it take to do the right-hand side than the left-hand side? Now, if a patient needs help to sit up, we can use the head of the bed, right? You'll see that a little bit later in sitting and repositioning. But really, at the end of the day, it's not that much different. Did you also notice safety for caregiver? Look at the angle on the nurse's back. Look at the angle here. He's slightly cut, cut out of the picture. But does it make a difference for him? Absolutely. What if he does this 20 times a day? Does that cumulative increase bend in his back change how he feels at the end of the day with something as simple as leaning over the patient to do vital signs? Five patients a day, four times a day for a CNA doing that, right? That's 20 times a day just in vital signs. So again, this is an opportunity for mobility. No, he's not walking around the hall, but this is mobility. He is engaging with gravity, right? How many times a day could he do this? Four to six times a day he could be doing this. Let's look at oral med pass. Kaylee talked about this, right? Similar situation. So this is a separate intervention. The vital signs might have been, or an AccuCheck might have been the CNA first thing in the morning, right? Oral med pass. Do we give it laying down? Number one, for safety for the patient, in which position are they more likely to aspirate or have difficulty swallowing? They're going to do much better drinking, swallowing, if they're at risk. Not every patient's at risk, but if they're at risk, the right-hand side is much better, isn't it? 
not to mention the fact that that's an additional sit up. It doesn't take very long. And even if it takes 30 seconds for the patient to struggle through, there's value in the struggle. Let them do it. Remember, when you are their muscles, they lose their own. When you do not challenge their muscles, they lose them. This patient will very quickly become somebody who needs help to sit up if you don't enable him and empower him to continue sitting up by himself. And the time really is not much more to do this. What about getting up to the bathroom, right? If I get the patient up and if I do that mobility screen first thing in the morning, they're going to want to pee. Yes, they are. Can we bundle care? Can we look at this as a way to work smarter, not harder? Let's look here and look at a moderate assistance, right? I didn't even ask him if he could get up. I just assumed. In this particular position, how often will patients assume the victim role? They don't know. They just let you lift them. Well, she didn't ask me if I could do it by myself. So I kind of just let her lift me. Patients do this all the time. We have to stop doing this, folks. We have to have ask them, please sit up for me. Not do you want to sit up? Very different question. Not do you want to? Tim, go ahead and sit up for me, please, at the side of the bed. You can say it in a nice smiling tone, but it's authoritative. It's not really a negotiable, right? Unless there's a real reason he can't. So let's look at this. Is it safe for me, the caregiver? No, right? I use the best body mechanics I kind of could, right? How often do we just assume we didn't even screen him? We just said, okay, let's get up to the commode. You need to go pee? Oh, hurry up, right? Let's undo the gown. We did leave his underwear on for his dignity. Obviously, this is acting out these, but you get the idea. When we don't do a screen, it's not safe for him. It's not safe for us, right? Now what we're doing is we're saying, all right, we know that's not good. Let's use safe patient handling. I know, let's get the lift to get him up onto the commode. How many of you in safe patient handling are thinking, yep, this is a great idea. How many of you therapists are like, whoa, 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 stop. What are you doing? You're lifting him passively. Let's take a look at this, right? And those are legitimate concerns. If we only check the safe patient handling box and not the mobility box, we can start to unintentionally use more passive devices. Now, when we compare and contrast these, right? Better for the caregivers on the right, isn't it? But is it better than the patient? It's safer for the patient in terms of knees buckling, but we are weakening the patient if he has capability to stand and we use a passive lift, we are not helping him get stronger. So let's now think about what this would look like if we use a mobility screen. Our goal is walking in all of these. We didn't accomplish it with, or at least a stand transfer, highest level. We didn't accomplish it with a lift. We did kind of unsafely accomplish it with this way, right? He got weight bearing but let's look and see what happens when we do a mobility screen. Oh, look, he's got strength in his legs. Let's see if he can stand. Can he stand up? He's short of breath. He doesn't want to do it. He's pretty ornery. But you know what? He got up, right? He was able to stand. Can he step forward and back? This is how fast a mobility screen is. Now, in this case, he started to do this and then he lost his balance and then he fell. So, he wasn't real safe when it came to the marching and stepping. If we use the BMAT, that's a three. If we use the MSST, that's a three N. He does not need power. He can stand with a non-powered device. Now compare contrast. What does it look like in the left? What does it look like in the right? He's still getting weight bearing, right? Oh, but we could do it faster in the left. Yeah, but that extra few seconds of weight bearing on the right is going to be better for Tim. Look at his upper body. He's more upright. He's more comfortable. We're not reefing on his arms. Now compare safe patient handling alone to safe early continuous mobility. Both of these are safe for the caregiver. Would you guys agree? Both 
safe for the patient. Would you guys agree? But one promotes mobility and one doesn't. So hopefully you can see here how the choice of tools makes a difference in terms of whether we're doing traditional stay in bed, bad, bad for the patient, safe for the caregiver if the patient stays in bed until the patient falls on the floor, right? Using the passive devices when a patient is capable of standing, it keeps the caregiver safe. It has in the moment safety for the patient. They're not going to fall, but it's creating safety issues for them later because it's making them more passive. Safe early continuous mobility, that's the ticket. That's what we're looking for on the right-hand side. Okay, let's get him back to the chair, right? So um, bringing in the walking piece. Now, why, why are we showing this? Do you take the foot plate off and have them walk? Or do you just transfer with them with the foot plate on? And when you're looking at pieces of equipment to purchase, I recommend look for devices that do more than one thing. If you're going to go between a sit to stand aid that has a removable foot plate and a sit to stand aid that doesn't, I'm gonna go with a removable one. Vendors, if there are any people in the room who are doing R and D, I have an ask of you. That flap up mechanism that you have on the seats of your powered non-powered stand aids, can you give us a mechanism like that on the foot plate so that we don't lose it and it doesn't get separated from the machine? Because that would make our lives so much easier. Okay, off my hobby horse for that. Hopefully, R&D folks, you heard that and you'll take it back. And next year, we will see a non-powered stand aid with flip-up seats and flip-up feet. All right. When the patient has an urgency to go to the bathroom, don't worry about walking in that moment. Because if they're walking and they pee on the way, you've lost, you've lost ground. Get them there quickly and safely. Let them pee, then take the foot plate off, and then they can walk back to the chair and take some steps. All right, have them be part of the process. Have them put the flaps down behind them. Look how excited he is to get up. Isn't that great, right? But we're explaining to him, remember your doctor told you how important it was, right? He's going to put his own flaps down. He's going to wipe his own bottom. Have them do as much as they can for themselves. When they get to the chair, same thing right? Maybe you have them do five sit to stands. It's making him cough. Is that good? Absolutely. We want to move those secretions. He doesn't think so, but we want to help him recover. Letting those secretions sit in the bottom of his lobes, that's not going to be good for him and it's going to cost us more work later. All right. So again, thinking about when to use the foot plate, when not to use a foot plate. All right. So Doctor's been in. How many of you are tallying? He had vital signs. He had oral meds. He got up to the bathroom. It's not even therapy time yet. Now we're going to go in with him for therapy. Now the fun really starts, right? So we're going to get him up and I want you to think about, and therapist, you can critique my technique. That's fine. Um, we said not to use gate belts for lifting, right? This is a compare contrast of a traditional way without any safe patient handling equipment and then with. Now in this one, you're going to see, I need somebody to pull the chair behind me because he is not real steady on his feet. He has fallen several times. His knees buckle and some of it is behavioral where his knees just buckle and he doesn't what he wants to be done. So we're going to go ahead and get him up. We're gonna block his knees right? He's in a low surface. So even if he was able to get up from the bed, it might take us a few times to get him up. Therapist, we do this rocking back and forward, don't we? To get our patients up, right? I'm blocking his knee. He is not happy with me. So in this moment, he's had a fair amount of mobility. He's been up in the chair. He's a little bit tired. Maybe not the optimal time to be doing my therapy, but this is when I have to do it. If we could schedule every single patient for the optimal time, wouldn't that be lovely? But the truth is we don't. So we're going to do his mobility here, right? 
Does this look familiar, therapists? I've still got to figure out the oxygen tank and the IV pole and the wheelchair because he's been falling and I don't trust him. Do you see the death grip I have on the gate belt? I don't trust him. So I have no space between him and I because I'm kind of anticipating that he may go down. Is this safe? 91% of therapists get hurt in the course of their care. Is this safe? Is it safe for the patient? Is it safe for me as a therapist? Does it accomplish our optimal mobility goals? Therapists, I was recently at um, Combined Sections in San Diego. I don't know if any of you went. We talked a lot about reactive balance. Am I working on reactive balance with Tim? How's gait speed? Am I able to force his cadence? Can I work on balance at all? No, right? I've got to hold him on such a death grip that it, it um, is not good. Now, I want him to do a second walk. He's not having it. He doesn't want to walk at all. But guess what we want to do? We want to go a little further. He's had a break. We want to go a little further. And watch what happens, right? Down he goes. Therapist, has this ever happened? Hurry up, hurry up, get the chair. As he's sliding down my leg. Right? Not good, is it? Luckily, I want to just bring him back to this now. Tim's a pretty good actor, right? We see this. Watch his face. Okay, did you catch that? We hurt our patients, guys. We hurt our patients when they fall and we catch them. Is there a better way? Let's think about what it looks like with uh, an ambulation harness. Now, I do have a bias here. Ambulation harnesses are the most underutilized tool for mobility in our portfolio. There are many options in your vendor hall. If you're serious about achieving highest level of mobility, if you're serious about it, go to the vendor hall and get in every ambulation harness you see. Try it. Put it on. Fall in it. Feel what it's like. This tool is so much underutilized for our high fall risk patients, for our patients that we can be doing reactive balance in therapists, nurses, to be able to walk those patients who are weak, whose legs do buckle, who have already become deconditioned or who came to us deconditioned. Kaylee talked a lot about the ICU and not allowing our patients to become deconditioned. But the reality is many of them are deconditioned when they get to us, or they've had a stroke, or they've got some other immobility related problem. They're not our 30 or 40 year old ARDS patients that we traditionally see in the ICU. There are elderly general medical deconditioned with lots of comorbidities. So how can we maximize function? Get them walking. If you, again, I'm going to say it one more time. If you're serious about this as a nurse, a PT, an OT, if you're a physician, if you're a vendor and you're serious about this, look at promoting these walking slings um, because this is how we do it. So we're going to look again at how we got Tim up. Now, that took us about two minutes to put the harness on. I deliberately left that all in. How many of you are thinking, I don't have time for that in my eval. That's great, Margaret, but I don't have time. I want you to put that thought aside for a second and look at what you get with the rest of your time compared to what this looked like when we did it manually. And then I want you to think again, is it worth my two minutes to put this device on? And again, there's lots of different versions. I'm using it with a ceiling lift. You can also use it with a floor-based full body lift. Get in them, go walking in the hall, in the vendor hall. I want you to critically appraise, safe for the patient, safe for me. Is he giving the same amount of effort in both? Absolutely he is. We do not use the power in the equipment when the patient can power it themselves. It's there if we need it, but we do not use the power unless we need it. 
This is so crucial to the difference between safe patient handling on its own and safe early continuous mobility or safe patient handling and mobility, right? So now that he's up, what do we gain? I don't need somebody to pull the wheelchair behind me, do I? I can bring the oxygen tank behind me. I can let Tim fall. Imagine that. I can work on reactive balance. Look at the difference here. Look at the left hand compared to the right hand, right? The left hand side, therapy's over, isn't it? We're done. He is not going to allow me to get him up again. And what's therapy going to look like tomorrow? He might swear at me the minute I walk into the room. You made me get up when I told you I was tired, Margaret. I told you my legs were weak. I told you I couldn't do it. Yes, you can, Tim. Come on, I'll hold you up. Come on, you're safe. You've got this. We've got this. Come on. How often do we say this, guys? And this still happens. Patient, is that a fall? Do we report that fall? Or is that kind of expected in therapy? I know I'm harping on this a little bit because this is such a big deal because I see this practice so often still. Let's get our patient safe. Now, left-hand side, we're done, aren't we? No more therapy. We're over. But right-hand side, we can keep going as many times as Tim falls. If he needs a rest, I'll power up. I'll let him kind of just sit in that harness a little bit. He can rest in it. And then we can keep going. And if I overdo it and it's too much, I just lift him with the lift back to bed. So how much more do I get for that two minutes it took me to put the harness on? Therapists advocate for equipment in your facilities you saw just there let's tighten that up let's raise the head up the power the the hanger bar up a little bit let's give you more support you're getting tired we can give you more support how safe is it for me how much lifting am i doing none how safe is it for for tim completely safe am i able to implement my therapeutic principles better manually or with equipment. All right, so when it comes to therapy, we can do so much more when we use these tools. And occupational therapists in the room, I'm going to apologize to you right now because my occupational therapist was not able to come for the videos when we were doing them. Um, but you get the same idea, right? You can use the same tools in occupational therapy. Here's another example of a max assist with a couple of steps using a different device comparing manual to mechanical assisted, right? On the right-hand side, he's falling, he's safe. This is a powered stand aid. The other one, we were using a floor-based lift or a ceiling lift. There's more than one way to do this, guys. Um, know your tools, play with them, explore them in the vendor hall, and, and then advocate for them in your facility. All right, what about boosting? So Tim is back to bed now, and he's exhausted he fell he's not happy he's wants to go back to bed and we're looking at boosting him up in bed let's do a little bit of a compare contrast here as well because just because he's boosting doesn't mean he shouldn't be contributing look at the manual technique right does that look familiar anybody a heave ho here we go and tim's not that heavy what if we use a slide sheet underneath now both of those were passive with the chuck with the slide sheet, but then the last one you saw it being more active where, where Tim was able to push with his own legs. Once that slide sheet's underneath, we can have him do all kinds of mobility. Let's look at this with a um, repositioning sling. What is this? Passive, right? But can we make it more active? Could he move his own legs? Absolutely. Should he? Absolutely. So we saw boosting manually, not safe for us, not safe for the patient, and not promoting mobility. We saw boosting passively with the slide sheet or with the repositioning sling. Passively keeps us safe. The patient is safe in the moment, but we're weakening him. Actively using his own legs with the slide sheet or with the repositioning sling, that's SECM. So hopefully you're beginning to see a pattern here. Now let's look at turning, right? Tim wants to be turned over. What does this look like? Manually, right? 
We're turning him over. It's passive. Is it safe for him? Is it safe for me? Doesn't create real a whole lot of safety issues for him in that moment. It's not safe for me. And look at what happens if our nurse's aide tries to wash his back. He's got to reach over the bed, right? And he's right at the edge of the bed. Can he, Will he stay there? What happens if I let him go? He turns back over again, doesn't he? So let's look and see now what happens when we use safe patient handling. This is one way of doing it. Now, you'll see here, he's kind of rolled over to the side. I probably should have lifted him over first before I turned him. But you know what? We can do that by combining tools as well. Here, you'll see we use a slide sheet and a repositioning sling. It's safe for us. Is the patient doing anything? No, right? It's safe patient handling. We've checked that box, but we have not checked the patient mobility box. Now, let's look at turning with just a slide sheet. All right, on the left-hand side, you've got manual. On the right-hand side, you've got active assistive. Look at how he can push himself back. And I want to point out one more thing to you right here. When he's at the edge of the bed, we've got to hold him there. But nurses, if there's any of you in the room, get the patient to three quarters prone, get their knee up. That's what's going to hold them there stable so you don't have to hold them there, right? Safe patient handling versus manual, it's safer, but um, the patient's not doing a whole lot. Even in the ceiling lift, the patient can participate. Tell him to beat it. Beat it, beat it, beat it. Get there before the lift does. Try and get slack on the lift. That is building SECM even when you're using the lift. Let's look at sitting up versus manual. Sitting up is one of the hardest things that we do, isn't it? Having him turn over to the side, right? Bringing him up to a sitting position. This is hard for us to do. But what if we use safe patient handling equipment. In this position here, we're going to use a repositioning sling. We're going to bring the head of the repositioning sling up and we've got a slide sheet underneath his butt to pivot him around. So we don't need to put all of the pieces of this sling on. We could use a seated sling for this as well. And then we're going to bring him forward. Both of these methods are pretty passive. Is there another way that we could do this that builds mobility into this supine to sit and allows Tim to participate a little bit more? All right, let's look at what it might look like using a mobility harness. I'm going to just go forward a little bit here. We get the harness on. And then use the head of the bed combined with a mobility harness or an ambulation harness to bring him up and now he can participate as well, right? He can be part of this process. We could use a slide sheet if we need to. He is still sitting up, but he's safe. If he falls, he's not going anywhere. And the other big difference that I want to show you is my position. Halfway through that lift, look at the difference in the position of the therapist. The patient position is the same but there's a big difference in the position of the therapist. You do this multiple times a day, and that makes a huge difference to how your back feels at the end of the day. All right, what about respiratory therapy? We talked about this earlier, the role of respiratory therapy coming in. So we've looked at vitals, oral meds, physician, up to the bathroom, up to the chair, therapy, <coughs> boosting actively, sitting up actively, Respiratory therapy, we're at 10 already. So the first way she does this, passive. She raises the head of the bed up a little bit. Patient's not doing a whole lot. Is there a better way? You're like, oh, Margaret, okay, we get it. We get it, right? But again, looking at these opportunities throughout the day for um, respiratory therapy to be working with the patient, getting them up, listening to his lungs and standing, his diaphragm is going to drop down, more mobility for Tim throughout the day. Let's lastly look at what we can do. This is not so much a mobility. Remember when we looked at the 
different mobility levels. And again, this is a different scenario. I didn't have this in the acute care side, but wanted to show it in, this is a home care scenario, right? Patients on the floor, let's lift him up. Does this look familiar, anybody? If you don't have equipment, maybe we grab three more people. Um, another couple of people grabbed him, right? This is not good for anybody in this situation. There is a better way. You've got, and, and there's many devices to get patients off the floor. Again, please be engaged in the vendor hall. Go and look at all the equipment they have. This is using a full body lift with a seated sling for floor recovery. Look at the difference, right? Is it safe for Tim? Is it safe for us? Are we doing any lifting? The patient's still on the floor five minutes later because we need to go and get more help on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, everybody's safe. So this is an example of passive mobility. He's on the floor. We don't know if he's hurt. We've screened out any major injury, but we've got to pick him back up. This is not a rehab moment. This is not active daily mobility. This is passive activity. If we are teaching a patient to get off the floor, there's different ways that we can do that. So in summary, SECM looks for ways to assist patients with maximum movement that is safest for both the caregiver and the patient and maximizes patient participation. Always keep the goal in mind. Is this passive movement? Is it active daily mobility or is it rehab? What's our mobility goal? Is it sitting up, standing up or walking? What are we trying to get that person to? What equipment can best achieve all of our goals, not just one of them? How can we help Tim meet his goal? Together with a knowledge of SECM, we can help Tim get back to what matters most. This is what it's about, folks. All right. Um, I think we have about six or seven minutes left for questions.